Welcome everyone, I think we're live now. This is my first one, so you'll have to excuse me. First things first, we need to invite Lauren in. Hopefully she can be present today. It's gonna be a very short episode, if not. Lauren's right, this is awkward when you're waiting for people. Hopefully she won't be too long. So for any of those wondering while we're waiting for Lauren, um, Lauren hasn't had a haircut and taken up weightlifting. I am her older brother, Grant. So today I'm going to be putting her through her paces. I'm going to be asking her the questions that she asks all her guests. I think we've got her, hang on. Hey, there she is. Hello. Great stuff. How are I'm you? I'm sure okay? uh, many people probably won't be recognising me right now, but here I am. Why wouldn't they be recognising you? I don't know, it might look a little bit different, not like a nurse, you know. Uh, there was a comment from yesterday's episode that compared Lauren to a nurse, which is fine. The heroes of 2020 and all that. Absolutely. I'll take oh. it all day long. That was the longest 15 seconds of my life there, waiting for you to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came on and then I couldn't hear what you were saying. I couldn't hear you. So I was like, oh, OK, here we go. So then I went off and came back in. But it's nice to see you, bro. Nice to see you too. I've got... Uh, specially allocated people watching out this time. Um, last episode, my audio was on for a second and off for a second, so got people watching out for that today. Um, you've done a lot of these episodes already, uh, but you've never been in the hot seat before. So just before we start the episode, you told me that I need to get a good frame for the, the picture or the thumbnail. So if you could just smile for a second. <laughs> that was make my job a lot easier. Okay, check so, it just, oh, You've got a tick list. <laughs> I love it. Well, you, I'm just going to turn you up because I can't. There we go. Right, that should be good. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I could hear you, but I just you weren't loud enough. But I can hear. Oh, you okay, it's great stuff. So, for those watching who have never seen one of these before, the call room, the the namesake of this show is before you go and race, before you actually swim the race, everyone has to gather together so your heat will all gather in what's called the call room so it's where people will sit and listen to music or they'll chat to their friends and it's where essentially you wait for your turn to race so that is the call room so that's the name of the episode um people aren't here for me they're here for you lauren as much as i would not like to admit that so just give a little bit as you do to everyone else a little bit of 30 second background on who you are as a person and then we'll get straight into it Okay, so who I am? I'm Lauren Quigley. Um, I, well, I started swimming very young. My mum was a swimmer, an anti swimmer, and so we both um, got into swimming. We learned to swim, and then, yeah, just went from there, really. Mum didn't want us to swim, uh, so she put us in every sport other than swimming really um to, to try and get us to do something different and then we loved it so we carried on and and went through and and yeah so my career ended with three silver medals at the Commonwealth Games I did two world championships um I won British champs I just I just had a great time as well you know medals and everything aside uh, I had a great career and met some amazing people along the way but I'm sure we'll get into it so uh yeah if you're destroying the place. Okay, so the first thing that you always ask your your guest is, what kind of call room athlete were you, Lauren? What kind of call room athlete? I think I was the comedian. Well, I like to call myself the, well, I say I like to call myself. Someone did once call me the call room comedian because I just love to make everyone else laugh, really. I, uh, I always find myself make trying to make everyone else feel comfortable and making people laugh I love to do that you know that's one of my main things so I used to look around the call room and see the nervy people and see the people with headphones on and then 
I saw if I ever saw an opportunity to talk to someone, I was straight over to them, trying to make them laugh, you know. And if I ever saw someone that looked a bit nervous, I'd try and sort of get involved there as well and make them feel comfortable. And yeah, just just go around the call room and just have a bit of a laugh, really, and enjoy it. You're the kind of call room athlete that I try to avoid with my big headphones. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, I can definitely vouch for that. I'm sure people used to saw me coming and go, "I'm out." But when I did actually retire, um, I think more people more people were upset I wouldn't be in the call room anymore than just be there, just in general. Because uh, they said, you're the funnest, whenever in the call room with you, the funnest person to be with. And that's, to me, that was just great to hear. And do you think you did that because you were nervous yourself or just simply for the sheer love of making people laugh? I think a mixture of both, for sure. I was I definitely used to get really nervous and so probably it was it sort of mixed well with a coping mechanism of mine but then also because I love to do that anyway it was like oh it's a no-brainer. Fair enough a good mix there so we'll get straight into the quick fire round then this is something that you've had great success with and I've actually prepared some uh, some questions here I forgot about that. I forgot yeah. about this round. Here we go. Got a few interesting ones in there. Now, you always, always criticise me for asking for too much information. So if you want any clarification, you're not having it. <laughs> okay. Straight off. <laughs> I've tried to alternate between normal and Christmas questions because I know how much you like your Christmas stuff. Okay, first off, racer or trainer? <laughs> uh... Quick fire. Quick is the operative. Trainer. 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 Okay, would you like, would you prefer one coloured lights or multi coloured lights? <sighs> multi coloured on the tree in the porch blue. <laughs> so, so like our house has had for a decade, got it? Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't swimming, what would it be? What other sport would Football. you do? Football. Football. No, no other contenders? No. Nothing else you'd like to do? Okay, okay. What is your favourite Christmas film? I think the latest Grinch. And I know that's controversial because everyone likes the old stuff, but the latest Grinch. Which one's that? Who's that? It's the one that came out a couple of years ago and we went to the cinema to watch it Christmas Eve. <laughs> I, I can't remember who the Grinch is in that, but yeah, I know what you mean. Okay, the Grinch, <sighs> interesting. Favourite Christmas song? It changes. All I want for Christmas. Is there a second? Maybe driving home for Christmas. Okay. Fairy okay. tale of New York. I can't choose one. Okay, we've got some great, great hits there. Now I know it's a quick fire round, and you're supposed to answer quickly. But listen carefully to this question before you assume what I'm going to ask. Okay. <laughs> Would you prefer an individual bronze? Or a relay silver. Relay silver. Oh, I thought that might throw you a little bit because it's not the relay gold. Okay, all right. Still going for the position. I like it. Christmas Eve or Boxing Day. Boxing Day, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. Morning training or afternoon training. Morning training. Morning training. Okay. What's your favourite Christmas dinner item? Do you know, I've asked everyone else this, and I've not even thought about this myself. I, uh, I like my parsnips, you know. Okay, okay. Uh, now, I know what goes on our Christmas dinner plates, but of that Christmas dinner plate, what is your worst item? Well, it used to be mange too. We've but I know that was, mom, that was the only veg mum liked, so I, I was willing to, to eat those just to make her feel comfortable. Yeah, we got, we got rid of them. What is your favourite type of swim session? Oh, Dr. Feelgood. A Dr. Feelgood. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know what that is, uh, a Dr. Feelgood was a type of session we had um, where we'd say the doctor is in today. And what that meant is you could do whatever you chose and then go home guilt-free. So it's <laughs> no, it's no being surprise. serious though, being serious, that sounds <laughs> bad. Being serious, I love the, I quite like short rest interval stuff. Mm. Okay, yeah. okay. 
So the doctor's a close second, is it? Oh, is this? Is oh, this I mean, when the doctor's in the house, what more could you want? But yeah. 25, 50, just wet your trunks and then home. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Would you rather get one big present at Christmas or loads of little presents? Oh, it's got to be one big one, surely. Well, I don't know. If you've opened it and then everyone else is opening through the day, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I was going to ask, it depends what you mean by big, but I know you'll just go, oh, I'm not, not going to elaborate. Well, a, large, so. a large present, something like a... Something more expensive. Um, yeah, go on. Not big large a massive one. Massive present. Big large one. A big large one. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Would you wait? Would you open that in the morning, or would you wait till the afternoon? I'd probably wait. You'd probably wait. How long do you think you could yeah. wait for? Oh gosh, are you trying to ask me for this this Christmas? You're going to send me something and then go. You haven't got anything. This this is your Christmas present. This Christmas. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Two o'clock. Well, we know that Dad... Depends if you're in lockdown or not. If you're in lockdown at 4am on my own. <laughs> my, dad, my dad likes to hide his presents around the house so that he's always the last one to open them. Um, what is your favourite pool? Worldwide. We'll go worldwide and then we'll go UK. I think uh, Ponds, Ponds Forge has got my heart. Worldwide? Got, yeah, worldwide. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's it's got so many memories in that. I've got so many memories in that pool. I think it's got to be Ponds, Sheffield, for anyone that doesn't know Ponds. Okay, you kind of threw in the UK question, but we'll move on from that. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is your What is your Christmas tea top? Christmas tree topper. We've got a fairy. We have always had a fairy. That's very nice. Yeah, you've asked everyone else that. And it's there's some, old, some interesting toppers out there. There are some interesting toppers for sure, especially nowadays. This one's a little bit tailored to, to you and I, but I, I think you'll appreciate it. Would you rather listen to Justin Bieber's Mistletoe for 24 hours non-stop, no choice? Or would you rather stand in the after Christmas next sales queue for 12 hours? Oh, it's got to be Justin Bieber Mistletoe. You've probably it's done the next sales question. queue a few times. Next sales... No, I, I'd still have um, PTSD from that, <laughs> standing in the queue in, in next. Yeah, the, the travel tents from Boxing Day. Um, it sounds crazy now that we would go and fight our way through those crowds. And no one wants to be in a crowd nowadays. Um, oh. It was a different place now, but... Okay. So that's the quick fire round covered off. I hope that wasn't mm -hmm. too, too taxing. You seem to get those quicker than I thought. Well, um, you know. But... You don't seem to get in the spotlight too much on these call room episodes. It's typically focused on your guests. So what I want to start with is the very beginning, chronologically. How did you get started in swimming? Obviously, I know the answer to this, but this is how the interview works. So why yeah. don't you tell everyone else how you got started in swimming? Uh, yeah, sure, definitely. Um, my, Like I said before, our start was learn to swim and then do a different sport. Uh, Mum swam herself, knew how difficult swimming is as a sport. Knows how great it is, but also, yeah, knows how difficult it is. And so she tried to, she wanted us to be able to basically save our lives and then go into something that probably got us a bit more money or something. Um, like so, yeah, so we, we did all the other sports. And then we, I used to go and watch Mum because she was a swimmer and I used to stand on poolside with a coach called John Woodrow, uh, holding his hand when I was little and walking up and down poolside with him, watching mum swim. And I just wanted to be mum. Uh, you know, mum is my absolute rock. She's, she always has been. She's my best friend. And I wanted to be exactly like her. And so when mum realised that I wanted to swim, she, she, there was no stopping, you know, me or her then. She was 100% supportive. She was always supportive, but... You know, it was right. What you know, what can we do to for Lauren to enjoy this journey? And um, so yeah, so that was my start in swimming. Um, and where did you start you... to swim? I started um, at a club called Saracens. We had a great uh, network there, great team there. Uh, obviously, both you and I started there. We had a coach, Kevin Nuttall, uh, who was who was brilliant all the way through my career. Can't compliment Kevin enough for everything he's done in his support. And yeah, we, we, were, rough, we were lucky, I, I, in my opinion, because we started at a club that had 
the right values, a great team, uh, you know, a great atmosphere at training. Um, we had the coach that was really focused on skills and stuff like that and all the important stuff that, again, I, I you know, put all, most of my career, my success to that start and having that start in swimming. And so, yeah, that's where I started or we started. And then we just went from there. Brilliant. So this is another good question to start with because it kind of sets the scene. It's been a very unusual year with uh, the coronavirus. Everyone's kind of changed how they're doing things. So tell everyone a little bit, a little bit about how your COVID year has gone. You know, what, what have you been up to? What are you working on now? Because I hear there's some very exciting things in the pipeline. Yeah, it's been a super exciting day. Thanks for the plug, Grant. Uh, it's been a super exciting day today. But yeah, the year started really, it's just been an interesting year, uh, you know, a difficult year, everything in one really, all the emotions. And I started off the year, I had a cycling accident. And so I broke my wrist, uh, damaged my hip, my elbow, you know, all sorts happened. And, uh, and then we went into lockdown and it was just like, what is this year going to be, you know, and sort of took a few weeks to just go be a bit confused and a bit lost, I'd say. And then through the year, I've, I've, foc I've it's really made me think. I, I call this year the year of thinking. And I think everyone's been forced to, to obviously think a lot more and assess what they're doing in their life at the minute and all that sort of stuff. And... I really had to think about what do I want to do? What, what, what do I want to be doing when all this ends and stuff like that? And so I came up with Quigley Sport. I launched Quigley Sport. And if I'm being completely honest, I didn't know what Quigley Sport was going to be exactly. And people would say, what is it? And I would be like, well, I'm not really sure. But um, so, so yeah, so I launched Quigley Sport and then launched the core room and, and, really thought about what I wanted to do with it. And now I'm going into um, athlete mentoring and doing that at the minute, which I'm, I absolutely love. You know, that's, I, I think that's really important. Um, so I'm doing that. Jazz and I have just launched, uh, we're going to be doing swim camps together abroad um, and in the UK, hopefully. We've just launched our first one. It's going to be in Lanzarote uh, early next year. So that's super exciting. That's been it's been a really exciting day for that. Um, so yeah, jazz has been fantastic to work with. Um, I've also, uh, on Quigley Sport, like I said, doing the core room uh, separately from that, I've had, I've been working with a guy called Mark Botham on a running app and a running event and a sort of like a, uh, virtual run club where anywhere in the world you can, uh, join this virtual run club and you know, you're all in a running club together, basically. And there'll be events every week and stuff like that. So I've had that to focus on. So it's been a year of, I suppose, deciding or figuring out how I can um, give back to sport and in the best way that I think I can do that. And not just um, teaching swimming and stuff like that, but with the athlete mentoring and, and all that stuff as well. So, yeah, it's been a it's been a great year. I'm, I'm lucky I have great support around me. Everybody around me is OK, is well, healthy. So I really can't complain. Um, yeah, it's been a tough year, don't get me wrong. But there are people in a lot worse positions and you've just got to take the positives. So. It's, a very, it's the start of a very exciting chapter, I think. Um, you're doing some amazing things uh, in the sport and giving back to the sport by everything you're doing. So it's, it's all very positive and very exciting. Now, I've lulled you into a false sense of security enough. Uh, now back to the probing questions that you've you've enjoyed asking everyone else yeah. i hope all your teammates are now tuned in we've given oh, them enough time to get online because now <laughs> lose them all. who is your who is your favorite teammate now i'm gonna be uh, i'm not gonna be fair now to anyone that i've had on before this because i'm gonna go through a list because <laughs> i always swimming is an individual sport but it's absolutely not. It, that could not be further from the truth. And there's so many people throughout my career that have helped me get to where I am. The medals that I've won, if I could give a piece to every person that's, um, you know, been, played a part in my career, I don't think I'd have a medal left, to be honest. Um, and I'd love to be able to do that because they deserve it just as much as I do. And in terms of teammates, 100% you are my favourite teammate. Oh. Um, 
And that's not just because you're my brother, but you were the only one that knew how to deal with me before a race, you know, the week leading up to a competition. You were the only person I knew I could go to and go, you know, Grant, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm scared, I'm whatever it was, I could go to you. So 100% you. And obviously I spent my whole career with you or majority. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm going to get emotional in this episode. I just know it. So, <laughs> I was yeah, going to say you never heard it as PG as that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> 100% you, but there are so many people that, like I said, that contributed. Early in my career, we had the Nuttalls around us uh, who were phenomenal. They're basically family to us. Uh, people like Emily Parker, Pip Sanders at Saracens, you know, great people. Then I was at Manchester in Stockport. And there's too many teammates to mention in those two clubs, really. I had great, great people around me at both of those. Um, Devon Robbins was a big, positive person around me during a lot of my swimming as well. Must mention her. On the British team, Sophie Smith and Amy Wilmot, two of my roommates, uh, they were phenomenal. At Liverpool, Anthony Evitz in Spain and Lanzarote, I had the Brews, I had Lauren Stedman around me, and then towards the end, I had uh, Hannah Ewan. So all the way through my career, there was people around me that without any of those, you take one person out of that puzzle and it would be have been completely different. I really believe that. And so I apologise for every single guest that I've had on, but I've just got the rules and thrown them out the window for that question because I really can't answer that but my ultimate favorite would definitely be you oh thank you i was gonna say you're absolutely right that isn't fair on everyone else <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I mean, it is gonna, your do you want to just end it now should i just uh... <laughs> <laughs> it is your name above the door i guess so you know i'm being paid for this but uh, you know i guess oh. i've got to stick to the rules um <laughs> so a slightly less heavy variation on that then is uh, what was your favourite team? What what period in your swimming career to you did you have not the most success, but the most enjoyment? Where did you find yourself most often kind of taking a step back and thinking, okay, I'm really enjoying myself with what I'm doing here? I think I'm going to have to go back to the start because all the teams were brilliant. Um, and there's, there's positives out of every team I was at. But right at the start, and my home club Saracens, that period when we were all young, we just had a great time. We didn't think too much about it. We just swam. I mean, we were going against each other at the club champs and trying to beat each other's times. And, you know, it was just it was just great fun. And it was just being young and not overthinking it. And, yeah, just enjoying the sport, what it is. So I definitely have to say at Saracens. I don't remember beating many of your times early on, but puberty <laughs> got me a little bit quicker, which is always, uh, yeah. always what I was relying on, that growth spurt that never came. Um, that, that's brilliant. So you kind of touched on there about how the people around you are instrumental on helping you along that journey. You know, no one's an island, no one does it themselves. Um, to bring things down a little bit and, you know, not, not too too far, far down because you've already touched on that you'll be getting a little bit emotional but I think it's important that we always talk about the low points as well as the high points because you know quite frankly it's dead easy to go oh well this was a brilliant occasion and this was a great trip and that was fantastic and in turn your goal you know your whole mission statement with Quickly Sport is to help people get to those points it's not to help them through those points because anyone can do those themselves it's to get them from the low points and through the tough times to to the good times. So let's just dive into that a little bit. It, you know, what was your lowest point of, of your entire swimming career and how you managed to drag yourself through that? <clears throat> Clear the Pardon throat me. there. <clears> throat> um, yeah, this, I mean, obviously this is difficult to talk about um, a lot easier now. I would never have been able to talk about it even just up to a few months ago, really. Um, and it's, I am always, every time I ask this question to the guests, I, you know, I think, to be honest, brave, really, to talk about low moments because in sport you hit real lows. For me, it was definitely the year of 2016, just in general. Um, and I think 
the, the, I'm not going to go through the whole story because it's a long winded negative story. And after Boris has just been on the TV, I'm sure people want a bit of a laugh. However, it was, it was a year of, that had been built up all my life since, yeah, since I started swimming really. And it was like, oh, the Olympics, you'll go to the Olympics, you'll go, you'll go, you'll go. And I never once, I was trying to think before, I don't think I ever once said I'll go. Um, and yeah, I just, I'd, I'd worked really hard and I'd, I'd got to the point where the, the year before the World Championships, I got into the final in the 100 backstroke and I've just seen someone put a load of love hearts and that's nearly set me off anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't be putting love hearts. It's anyway. fragile, guys. Um, yeah, no, I'd, I'd had a great year before and it was like, everyone was like, um, <laughs> everyone was like, this is your year next year. And yeah, I didn't have a great start to the year and it was just mentally, it was a, it was a, it's a really tough year. And I got to the Olympic trials and uh, I got I told that, you know, there's a tracksuit there, re- you know, ready for you, um, after, you know, for after the race to, to qualify. And I was in the call room, uh, just just ready to walk out through the race and I was stood at the back of all the girls and I thought I don't care if I come last here I just want to get out of here and that was a that was obviously a real low and I think the the, the lowest the reason I felt so low was because I'd loved swimming all my life you know that's it had been it had been my joy my you know it was everything in a great way and I'd, I'd gone numb to it. I'd gone, I didn't care about it. I, did, I hated it. I, I was numb to, to wanting to, to win, to, to qualify, anything like that. And so that was difficult. And, and the hard thing was, yes, not making the team was devastating. You know, it was, we'd worked for it for years. But the more upsetting thing for me was I, I, hated the sport that I'd loved all my life you know I'd had that taken away from me the love of it and that was really hard to get my head around and it was it was more the fact that I just wanted to get out of there I didn't I did care about making the team but I also was relieved that I hadn't in a way in a bad way Mm. and so yeah that was a real that was a real low and that was after that that was three months in my room like not coming out depressed you know and I don't use the word depressed lightly genuinely I was was really low and I thought that that was it I never wanted to see a pool again um, and and you know came out of that luckily and thanks to my my circle around me um, you know I'm very very lucky with the circle I have around me and and when I say the circle around me I mean mum dad you Gainer Stan Spen and my nan those those people were the the prime people that got me out of that hole but yeah that was a real low uh, definitely that was the most point yeah, I think you touched on some really important things there. That the the hatred of the sport is almost worse than not having it because it's you're not just numb to it. That you know the hatred takes you all the way down the other end of the spectrum. So you've not only lost the love, but you've also you're also almost forced to do something that you hate because of that that expectation and that weight of expectation can be absolutely crushing. Um, like you say everyone else was saying, oh, you know, it's your year, the Olympics, this, that and the other. You were probably the only one of the group that didn't want you to go to the Olympics at that, at that moment. So it, it's it's a horrible feeling having that expectation put on you. Um, Definitely. And and to, to be fair, that and what I wanted to say, and I didn't say it and I should have said it, um, I kept everything in that year. I didn't let anyone know that I felt that way and that, in January, I wrote something on my laptop that said, I don't want to go. I hate it. And I still have that. And I only found it a few months ago and opened it and was like, wow, you know, I, I sort of forgot how low I got. And I didn't say anything to anyone. I just went through the motions because I was the oldest girl in the team at that time. And I loved the girls um, that I was swimming with. And I felt I wanted to take on the role of sort of being a captain and being there for them. And not bringing them down, that was important to me. You know, I, I'm all about lifting everyone up. And if I'm there going in depressed the training and everything and, and down about things and, and stuff like that and sharing those things, I, I really felt I didn't want to do that and bring everyone else down. 
Um, and, you know, coming out of it now, looking at it, it's so important to talk about those things. Um, I like to believe everything happens for a reason. And I don't think I'd be doing the mentoring and stuff now if I hadn't have gone through that. But I would encourage anyone to talk about things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And and you're right, it can be difficult to, to say these things. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure I spoke to you a few times during that period and not realising quite how badly you were, you know, trying to, with the best intention in the world, trying to, you know, raise you up and, and um, push you through a tough time by saying, you can, you can do this, I know you've got the ability, but it's only through that support and it kind of makes it worse because you know you've got these people behind you that want you to do it and you think that that's all they want and and it's hard to separate what they want for you from what what you think they want from you and you know a, a lot of people wanted you to go to the olympics for the wrong reasons and a lot of people wanted you to go for you and and again it's it's difficult to separate those two so again it can be absolutely crushing that expectation but um to bring to bring the mood back up a little bit uh, let's let's look at the inverse of that I'm yeah. fired, I'm sure. Let's do that. <laughs> to the highest point in your career. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the most successful. And, and I'm sure you've, you've um, explained this to a few of your guests in the past. But it's not necessarily most successful. But your, your highest point can be when you were happiest. I know you said it was early on. But what was the one defining moment that you were the most happy in the entirety of your career? Um, okay, I've got three. So you're just throwing all the rules out the window, aren't you? <laughs> so when yeah, all the guests but, come on, you know you what? Say, no, it's no. Christmas, all right? Let's go for it. Um, it's not I'll like you've been doing quick. a load of Christmas I'll specials. I'll try and be quick. Okay. Um, Commonwealth Games, uh, the last night, I got two silver medals. It was a sort of home games, which was phenomenal. Um, but the walking around um, the lap of honour after the 50 backstroke, seeing you, seeing mum, seeing dad, uh, giving you a hug over the barrier. I just, I'll never forget that moment. Luckily, we've got a picture of that, which is my favourite picture uh, from my career. That is an exception. Um, that, was, that was truly special. Um, the 100-100 the Swim for Leukaemia event um, we did for charity. It's for Lewis Coleman. Uh, that was super emotional. Uh, just everybody came together to break the world record and raise money for swim for leukemia and, and Lewis organized it for his in you know for his mum and stuff like that and that that was a real high moment that was the swimming community coming together everyone swam for not I think everyone probably did a PB I did a PB um and yeah that was a really special moment um to come together and everyone just watching Lewis on the blocks going last uh and I think he he, he you know, sort of beat his chest and then pointed to his mum and I was stood next to Jazz Carlin and we both just burst into tears and I was just so <laughs> proud of him yeah, and everything he's stop. done. Oh, just unbelievable to be a part of, for sure. Um, so that's got to be up there. And the night of the night I went broke the minute for the 100 back at the World Championships um, was a very special night because... I'd tried to break, the, as you know, I tried to, as everyone close to me now, I tried to break the minute for like five years. And I got as close as 1 minute point zero one uh, in Glasgow at the Commonwealth Trials. And I just yep. thought, you know what? It's just not supposed to happen. <laughs> uh, and I was so focused on breaking that minute. And then, yeah, five years after I'd gone a minute point four or something. Um, so it took me five years to take point four off. I uh, was at the World Championships and I was in the call room. And I had Missy Franklin on one side, Emily Seabon on the other. Hossu was stood in front of me. And I just thought, wow, I'm just going to enjoy myself. Missy was dancing. Seabon was dancing. Uh, it was just, we could hear the music from the stadium. And I just thought, Do you know what? I'm just going to enjoy this and not focus on the minute and focus on the process. And uh, yeah, I, I got in race the second length. I was basically smiling because I, I was like, I've done it. I've, I think I've done it. Uh, touched the wall. Uh, and I went like this because I saw only, uh, there was, I think there was maybe two or three 59 points. And then, and that was all I could see. So I thought, well, I've touched the wall. So it, one of those must be me. So I did this. I don't know if people thought I'd 
I thought I'd won the race, but it was just, you know, I'd broken the minute, which was huge. It was more important. Um, and it was a really, pardon? It was more important than winning the race that you'd done. Yeah, before. yeah, yeah. Um, and even, you know, I looked up, saw mum and dad with the flags at the top, uh, GB flags, which was just great. And they were right at the top. So they were like this big. Um, and... The, the most special thing about that night was it was the anniversary of my, well, our Uncle Simon's uh, passing. And so I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> and Simon was just... I need you to talk for a minute. <laughs> so Simon was, was our uncle, um, our auntie Gaynor, who had an episode recently on the call room, uh, her husband. And he was just an incredible human being he was such an inspirational figure in our lives um there's it's people think we're over exaggerating when we explain you know what an amazing person he was you know uh, i still think to myself today what would what would simon do in this situation what would he think everyone who met him um he left an impact on everyone you know they either uh they either loved him or they respected him one of the two um yeah, he was just phenomenal. He always supported us in, in whatever we wanted to do. Again, similar to what we said before, it wasn't expectation he put on you, but he always made sure you were pushing yourself to be the best, you know, the best that you can be for you. Um, it wasn't good enough to just settle. He, he was, he always wanted the best for his family. And yeah, he can't say enough, enough good things about him. Um, so that's, that's who Lauren was, was just explaining about. I'm glad you took over because I couldn't have said that better, really. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was obviously a very special night. Um, for sure. To uh, to compound that, you can't see, but there's a bookshelf there, my office bookshelf, and in front of the desk, there's a little picture of Simon on there, so he can uh, can watch me work. So, <laughs> so that's that's you know three great highest points there. It's not a highest point, so you've cheated, but. Moving on to, there's a hell of a lot of funny stories and, and amazing experiences that we've had throughout the whole career, but is there any that stand out that you haven't talked about yet or anything that you want to, to revisit that you think people should hear? Um, anything uh, that sticks out to you? So funny moments. Um, yeah, I've got a couple that I've got down. There are literally hundreds of proper belly laugh moments that I could probably talk for hours about and uh, with with different people and if anyone heard my proper laughing fit then it's ridiculous to be honest and I had so many of those moments with all different teammates and, and people in swimming. Um, meeting Michael Phelps was a hilarious moment because I, it was years ago and I saw him in the hotel and it, he was getting we were at the buffet uh, getting lunch between heats and finals and I couldn't believe that I'd seen him. And it was sort of starstruck. And there's only two people that have ever been starstruck um, by Michael Phelps and Mickey Mouse at Disney World. <laughs> but Michael Phelps was stood there and, this, and I was just like, oh my gosh, wow. And so he went up to get his dinner and I thought, I'm gonna eat what Michael Phelps eats. <laughs> so I followed him around the buffet and was putting everything he put on his plate on my plate. My plate was like this at the end. And I think he noticed what I was doing and just as a laugh carried on, just carried on going around the buffet. Um, He's twice so your that size, was a, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was funny. Um, and I, when I went back to the table, all my friends were laughing at me because they could, I think they could see that he noticed as well and was filling up his plate well every time. Uh, eventually, I put up the courage with a plate full of pastas asking for a picture. And uh, no way did I eat all that food. But I thought I might swim as fast as him if I eat the same food. Um, <laughs> second moment, at the time, it was, I was really annoyed. But when I look back now, it's hilarious. We did a challenge set, you and I, in the dungeon at Manchester Aquatics, so downstairs. Um, we had 100 hundreds freestyle off, I think it was 120 that year. I think we are about... 15, 14, no, 16, I don't know. It was at Manchester anyway. And uh, we just got off Simon these, uh, no, we hadn't got off Gainer, sorry, these music players for our ears to swim with. So we both made a playlist. And mine was under two caps, I think, in the pair of goggles. 
And I'm like, this is a great playlist. I'm going to smash this. And so I got in, did the first one, turned. And every time I turned my head, it replayed the song. So I listened to Enrique Iglesias' Hero for 100 hundreds because I couldn't even rip it out because I had my hats on and it was short rest, so I didn't have time to take it out. So not only did I listen to Enrique Iglesias' Hero, but I also knew if I was swimming too slow because I'd hear more of the song. Um, so that was that's that's funny to look back on. But I'm sure at the time I was livid. And um, it's not a funny moment, but the funniest, funniest person involved in my swimming who would make me laugh no end was Sophie Smith. Uh, she was just and is a great friend. I've known her all through my swimming. And she's just we used to laugh all night if we were rooming laugh about everything she she was brilliant in my career so yeah that's three moments but i could sit here all night i've seen an album worth of photos of you and sophie smith in all sorts of crazy situations and like i say i don't know who's going to watch this video so we need to filter loads of those situations out next question next question (laughs) absolutely (laughs) looking at your looking at your swimming career as a whole um again it's important to focus on both ends of the spectrum, not only what you do well, but what you do poorly. Was there anything you can highlight in your swimming career that you felt was a weakness of yours, something you weren't quite as good at, you wish you were better, or something you would have done differently, or, or anything like that? Um, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's loads, there's loads of things that I could have improved. I know that there is. Um, and... I, I definitely wasn't perfect. And, you know, there, were, there was a lot. There's one thing that um, sticks out with that, with that question. I had a conversation with a coach once and they said to me, you're too nice. And I thought, oh, thank you. You know, I thought, that's really nice of them to say that. And they meant it in, not in a negative way, but in a way of not positive. just like trying to make me realise something. And for a while, I, d- I didn't understand. And I was like, too nice. That's, that's really nice. And so I asked the question, what do you mean I'm too nice? We, you know, we're talking about how I can improve. I'm too nice. Now, I don't, I don't think I'm too nice. I don't, get, I, don't, I don't agree with that, obviously. However, when, when I asked the question, the coach elaborated. He said, you don't, ha- you don't have that fight enough. You don't have that fire. You don't get behind the block and go, I'm going to beat all of you. You know, internally, he didn't want me to walk on Paul side and do a Conor McGregor and be like, I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't like that, but he was just like, in your, you just don't have that switch of, I'm going to destroy you all when I get in this pool. And when I've reflected since I finished swimming, I suppose, yeah, he, he was right. And, and I've, I've really sort of gone over my career in my head many a times, uh, but this year particularly, and, you know, I look back at the Commonwealth Games with Georgia Davis, 50 backstroke final. Uh, we, you know, she, she got gold, I got silver. And at no point was I like, oh, I'm, I didn't win. Oh, I didn't win, you know. I really wanted to win that and I didn't win. I was like straight over to Georgia. Oh, my gosh, Georgia, that is amazing. Well done, you know. And I don't, not, I'm not saying it should be any other, but inside I wasn't like, oh, I really wanted to win that. I was like, oh, silver, great, you know, fantastic, Jordan, got, you know. And so I suppose for me that, that, was, that was probably a, a big weakness. It was not having that fight enough, probably wanting everyone else to be all right and do really well and actually, no, Lauren, like, want to win, want to beat everyone. You yeah. know, don't just get in and go, I've done my best, but, you know, that, and that's great, you know, sort of thing. I hope that makes sense. I, it does make sense. And I, I think there's a balance to be had, like you say, um, to have that killer instinct and that outward aggression to, to other swimmers is, is great. And, and you definitely need that if you, if you want to be the best, because sometimes when, you know, when the chips are down and you're on that last 50, only that, that outward aggression and I'm going to beat you all and I do want this more than you. Is, is going to carry you there and through the training as well. But I would also temper that and say that you definitely had the inward aggression towards yourself. It might not have been to other people, but um, in terms of you, you are your own 
biggest critic I've seen you be very harsh on yourself and you were an exceptional trainer you worked bloody hard and I think that comes down from challenging yourself as well so uh, yeah I, I understand where that's coming from that you are too nice and and that's not the reaction when you got silver that you would hope you would have you would hope that there'd be a little ember in there that thought oh I'm going to beat her next time but it's also important that you have that humility and, and, you know, you have the niceties of it as well. So it's definitely a balancing act between that and, and it's a weird one. I would, I would say, yeah, I can understand where the two nices come from, but so that's interesting. It's, and this is something that we've heard a few times now, every time we used to do a major event, our mum and dad would say, you know, make sure you enjoy it. That's the main thing. And like, a lot of advice you get from the people who are older or the people who have been there before when you're younger you kind of go yeah you got it and and you just it doesn't even enter your head at that point but i think that's such an important piece of advice you get caught up in these events and you're so focused on i must swim well i must swim down i must eat enough that you don't actually realize what you're doing and where you are um you don't realize that wow actually I'm at the games or actually I am at the nationals or, you know, wherever that may be, it could be regionals, it could be anything, it could be a school's gala. Wow. I'm actually here and I need to enjoy this. So with that in mind, are there any events or there any moments or days that you would go back? No, no, I'm not giving you that, that, that much actually. I just want you to pick one, one day. You're allowed to review one day. You can't change anything, but you get to watch it back. What would that day be? You've had to complete way on these. Disney World, yeah, okay. Fair, fair <laughs> Follow up question. Uh, does it any, have to be? Erased? Does it have to be? Can it be my career? Does it have to be a race I did? It doesn't have to be a race you did. It's, it's just any day in your career that okay. had something to do with swimming. Or sport, any day in my career, any day in my career, without a doubt, 100%, I would go back and watch your Commonwealth Games trials final. Oh, really? Nothing to do with me. I would go and watch you again. Absolutely. And I got more nervous for your races than my own, 100%. And I would have a sore throat after your races. But the amount of pride that I had from watching you race not, was nothing compared to when I raced. I'd love to watch you race, even though I was scared <laughs> and you know desperate to, to be able to b- push you down the pool or pull you on the rope or whatever. Um, I would 100% go back and watch you swim. Well, I can uh, I, I can definitely tell everyone that I was never as good as you, but that, that's, it's nice to hear that you'd like to watch me race. I was definitely a lot more nervous watching you. I didn't typically get too nervous for my own, but for you, for yours, especially at the Commonwealth, I was awful. I actually had a coach at the time tell me I wasn't to talk to you anymore until you'd raced. And at the time being who I was, it was very, oh, I'm not, I'm going to speak to her if I want to. But the wisdom in that was, I wasn't a nervous person. I was very chilled. So he could see the anxiousness in my behavior and he didn't want that transferring over to you. So I could see the wisdom in that. Um, I, I'd love to just touch on something you've just said though, because it, it is a pet peeve of mine. And that was, you said, I wasn't as good as you. Um, and I know that people say that and stuff like that. And, and it's, you know, it's lovely to say to someone, you know, you're amazing and you've done this and that and, and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of people say to me, I never got to your level. So that then they, they feel that it, you know, sort of disregards their feelings and what they went through in swimming. And that's so important to every single If anyone's watching this, if you just take away this, no matter what level you're at, the emotions, uh, the, the pride, the success, it's it's the same for for every person you know it's just as important so if you're nervous at the school gala and you're but and someone's nervous at the olympics you're both nervous it's they're both just as important Absolutely. and it shouldn't it shouldn't take anything away from anyone else's career um just because i went to the commonwealth games and got silver medals i trained with people at every single club who trained with me we did the same sessions, put the same amount of effort in. You know, yes, people might not have been bothered about nutrition and stuff like that. Or some people might have not put the same effort in. But there's guaranteed, you know, you, I know firsthand, you trained just as hard as I did. 
uh, if not harder at times. And, and so we did the exact same, but I got lucky and made the team and you just didn't. And that's, you know, that's, unfor- that's unfortunate. It's the look of, you know, it's the look of it, but uh, yeah, it's not, it, 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 it shouldn't, you know, play a factor in, uh, you didn't make it or you didn't do as well as I did. And, and for anyone watching, that's definitely the case. Yeah, no, I think you're right. That is a, that is a, a very important message to take away that, that it's everyone's on their own journey and, you know, comparison is is something that is never going to help you out really to do your journey something that um we were told often is that in swimming you have a lane open water is a little bit different so you can't really apply that out there but everyone has a lane you know you could be in the same race as michael phelps or you could be in the same race as eric the eel it's absolutely irrelevant they're in their lane you're in yours mm-hmm. there's no difference so just do your race exactly the same as you would and the outcome would be what it is so that that's that's a very important message so yeah thanks for pulling me up on that <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, you touched there on on how hard you trained and and that can never be understated you were trained really bloody hard and consistently as well and anyone knows without the passion it's just impossible physically it's impossible for a human to go through that without having not only the passion but the dedication there there are some points that get so difficult you know with the schedules with your you know your body breaking down whatever it may be it might just be the session is so hard that there are those moments that are make or break now again you know that both of us and our lot teammates went through these moments do you have anything that sticks out in your mind that you used to do because again it's a very individual thing that used to get you through those tough moments that used to get you through those real sticking points that kind of kept you driving on. Um, yes, I do. And it was a, a weakness and a strength at the same time. And for me, it was thinking about my inspirations, who, who I wanted to, my career, I wanted to make the people closest to me proud. That's what I wanted to do. And again, it was something that the same coach who told me I was too nice said, you're doing it for everyone else. And that was a big drive for me in in swimming. A lot of the time when I felt I don't want to do it, but I want to do it to make them proud, to make my family proud and all that, that drove me. Um, So my inspirations around me were were huge in getting me through times like that. the key ones I could look not up until just before the end, I could look across the pool and see you there, um, which helped massively through my career. And I'm so lucky that I had the luxury of, you know, having a sibling in swimming as well, um, because I know a lot of of swimmers don't have that. So I'd have you there um, to be grumpy towards or whatever. (laughs) Um, Gaynor and my mum, they, you know, in, they inspired me every single day all the way through um, and we touched on it before but Simon you know he like you said without putting pressure on you he just made you believe that you could do it and he loved it and he really wanted you to do it you know and, and be great and knew you could be great and so for me it was it was just my inspirations around me really um, but also, I think it's important to highlight that there are moments like that. And it's not about pulling yourself out straight away. It's actually going, I'm low here, or I'm struggling, or this is really tough. What I'm doing is tough. You know, I'm not a robot. So actually, I feel this way, and that's all right. And to, But tomorrow, you know, it's going to be better. And so it's just, it's, it's definitely a balance between accepting that and going, yeah, I'm human. So this is how I feel today. But today I'm going to give a hundred percent, whether that would be 60% on another day is irrelevant. As long as it's a hundred percent on that day, that's all you can possibly ever do. That's all you can ever ask for. Yeah. That's, that's a great piece of advice that as long as you're giving a hundred percent on the day, that's all you can do so so not to worry about it i guess 
Um, that's a great piece of advice. Touching on advice, I'm I'm aware that we've run 55 minutes so far. Um, I've oh, kept gosh. it for a little bit while, but um... sorry to bore everyone. I've absolutely <laughs> just me and you. It's like a FaceTime. <laughs> it's like a televised FaceTime at this stage. <laughs> if um, if you had one, wait, should we have a advice? break where everyone can go get some ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> if, if you had one piece of advice that you could give to little Lauren um, or, or to, to little anyone really, anyone starting up that swimming career or anyone working through it, if you had one piece of advice you could give out to them, what would that piece of advice be? I think that piece of advice would have to be um, the umbrella for me. The, the first thing, enjoy it. But that's cliche. Oh, enjoy it. Yeah, enjoy it. Seriously, enjoy it. It's done. That's it. Life happens. Um, it would be to believe and be more confident in your choices, especially as an older athlete, uh, especially in swimming as well. Swimming, stepping out of the swimming bubble I've, and being in the triathlon bubble, I realised a little bit that in swimming, we're very dependent on our coaches. Um, we, we have to have a coach at every session or we feel we do, or coaches make you feel they do, or, you know, it's important. Swimming is so technical. You need someone there to, to be coaching you. And so because you have that from young, you become very reliant on your coach. And what they say is gospel. And that's right. And they know me better than I know myself. So I'm just going to do everything that they say. And don't get me wrong. Coaches are brilliant, you know, and, and you're lucky to, uh, if you get a good coach, you're very lucky. Um, but be confident in yourself and know your, you know, your own body. And you know what we've just touched on. If you, as long as you're giving 100, percent you've got to, you've got to, yeah, be confident in your choices and your training and what you're doing, and and you know, work together with with who you're working with, not just be solely reliant on one person. Um, so yeah, just be more confident, and yeah. Brilliant. Just be more confident. I think, Just I think be it's more really confident important. and yeah. There's Back yourself. <laughs> Back yourself. I think it's a great message. Uh, you know, a lot of people yeah. second guess things, especially when the chips are down. And, uh, you know, it, it's tough when things don't seem to be going right. You go to a gala, you should swim fast in and, and you end up not swimming quickly. And it's easy at that point to question your choices up till then and, and do a quick U turn. But, um, you know, if you're working hard, then, then the rewards will come. Um, Brilliant. So that's that's all the questions I've got down. Is there anything you, you want to say in terms of messages, obviously, and then I'll, I'll sign off? I was just about to be like, no, no, you can sign off for me. Um, yeah, no, I'd just like to say, to every, if people are still watching at this point, thank you. I know this has been a long a long one. Uh, and just for the support in, on Quigley Sport and just me in general um, through my career and, and everything that I'm doing now, it means the absolute world. I cannot say that enough and I really genuinely mean it. Um, yeah, and just, I mean, what it's been a crazy year, but keep keep looking at the positives, everyone. Thanks for interviewing me, Grant. No worries. <laughs> um, Some, something I did want I'm wanna... sure this, I'm sure the, the, there's people on, I'm sure it's mum and dad and, you know, Gaynor and Hannah, you know. Um, but yeah, no, thank you to everyone that's watching. It's been great. This season's been fantastic. I've absolutely loved it. And uh, yeah, I just I, I did want to touch have on a great before. Christmas. Yeah, something I just did, I did want to touch on just before we leave. Um, uh, as you know, I watch every episode. Kerry Ann, uh, a few episodes ago, has actually stolen my thunder on this one a little bit. So thanks, thanks for that. But um, I just wanted to say to you, Lauren, thank you for everything you're doing with with not just with Quigley Sport. You know these these episodes are, are brilliant and i love every single one so thank you very much for those thank you for everything you're doing with quickly sport there's a real gap in in swimming and sport as a, as a wider area for for this kind of thing and you're doing some really good work for a lot of people that need your help um and just for being you really we, we we're all very proud of you you know the most of the viewers are all family and friends at the moment and uh we, we all love you very much and we, we appreciate everything you do. And we're very proud of you as well. That's that's the main thing. We're very proud of everything you've done and the woman you've grown into. I uh, just wanted to, to put that message out there and, and say thanks for everything. Well, thank you. I'm tearing up, so I'm going to go before I start again. Uh, <laughs> but no, that, that, really, that really means a lot. And so thank you.
Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Have a good night. Thanks a lot, everyone, for watching. Uh, have a good Christmas and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Yeah. Have a great Christmas, everyone. Bye. Bye.